Well, hello again, everybody. We're going to talk here about the opportunistic infections that we see in HIV AIDS. Um, and this is very important. This is commonly tested. You're going to be expected to know how HIV can present. And nowadays, typically HIV presents on routine screening with uh, the acute HIV syndrome, things that we talked about um, in previous talks. Um, now, if a person has HIV, they don't get treatment or the treatment fails, they may present with one of these uh, complications. Um, and so um, it's very important that you understand this, that you understand not only how we would treat these complications and diagnose them, but also with many of these infections, we actually prophylax HIV patients depending on their CD4 count. So that's going to be important for you to know as well. And so we're going to go over that. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or in the I button on the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. And certainly feel free to subscribe to my channel and you will get updates as I put more and more videos up. You can get notifications and whatnot. All right, so this is just the basics of HIV and transmission. Um, this is something I covered in our overview of HIV, uh, but it's worth knowing that it is a retrovirus and that it infects CD4 T cells. And as you probably know, CD4 T cells and T cells more generally are responsible for fighting off viruses and fungi and parasites. And so that's typically going to be where we see our opportunistic uh, infections. They're going to be atypicals as far as bacteria and then viruses and fungus. Um, so the natural progression is about seven to ten years from HIV infection to full-blown AIDS. However, we don't see this in the U.S. that much anymore because upon diagnosis, we put these patients on at antiretrovirals and they just never get to that point. Now, a patient's prognosis is based on their CD4 count. That tells you what their risks are of opportunistic infections and complications. However, how infectious they are is based on their viral load. So when you hear a person say that they have HIV but they're undetectable, we're talking about the viral load. Okay, so there are a number of opportunistic infections that we're going to talk about. Um, certainly above 500, they do have the risk of things like thrush and TB activation and even Kaposi sarcoma, although I would put that more here under 200. And you should also know that the normal CD4 count is between 500 and 1500. So this is normal. So once you start going below 500, then you start running the risk of these mild things like thrush and TB activation. I guess I wouldn't call that mild, but uh, uh, it's a little less problematic than some of these other things. So you dip below 200, you can get PCP and Kaposi sarcoma. We'll take a look at those. Below 100, it's toxo and cryptococcal meningitis. And then below 50, you get some of these more severe problems like MAC and CMV infection. So this is the um, sort of the number and the, the different kinds of, um, of opportunities opportunistic infections that you can get. We are not going to talk about tuberculosis. I did that in another talk. Um, we're also not going to talk about cryptosporidium, although I will recommend that you know if you have an HIV patient with sudden profuse watery diarrhea that this is on your, uh, on your radar. Now, we're not going to talk about candida. I talk about that in other sections, but pretty much everything else we're going to be talking about here. So we'll start with Pneumocystis gyrovecchi, also called PCP, based on its old name, which was Pneumocystis carini. This is a patient with HIV who's going to come in with respiratory symptoms, and they are going to be hypoxic in most cases. Okay, so pretty severe hypoxia in many cases, um, just because of the way that this, um, that this, this pathogen works. Um, so that's what I want you to gather from this. You're going to get an HIV patient who's hypoxic. Because you have a patient with 
pulmonary symptoms who's hypoxic, your best initial step is always going to be a chest x-ray. However, that's not going to diagnose PCP. You're going to need to get bronchoalveolar lavage. That would be the most accurate test aside from biopsy, which we basically never do. So the giveaway here is you're going to get your chest x-ray and what you're going to find is that the chest x-ray doesn't actually look that bad. It may show nothing or it may show some diffuse interstitial markings, but it's out of proportion to the radiologic findings. Now what I want you to gather from this is that this is basically the opposite of the uh, walking pneumonia, whereas a walking pneumonia, the patient appears generally fine, maybe a little bit of a cough. Uh, but then you get their chest x-ray and it looks awful. With PCP, they're going to have really bad symptoms, hypoxia, but you get, get their chest x-ray and it actually doesn't look too bad. So it's kind of the reverse. Another thing that you might see on a test question is that they tell you the LDH level is elevated. That is classic for PCP. So any positive test, once you diagnose them with with PCP, you should give them trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole or Bactrim. That's the standard treatment. However, if they have a sulfa allergy like I do, then you're going to give them clindamycin and primaquin. Uh, adjunctive steroids may be considered as well. So when do we prophylax for PCP? We prophylax for PCP when they drop below 200. And we just give them the same medication we give to treat. So that would be trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. However, if they have a sulfa allergy, then we give them Dapzone. And that's kind of um, not something we would expect um, considering the other medications that we uh, give. So you need to know that. Kaposi sarcoma is a dermatologic malignancy. It's caused by a herpes virus, HHV8. It's really the only thing that HHV... HHV-8 does. Um, the symptoms here are these cutaneous lesions. They're really, really dark, and they tend to be more disseminated. Um, you can see them pretty much anywhere, including on the mucous membrane. So think of the, the palate of the mouth. Uh, this has a very classic appearance. You start to see red or purple nodules on an HIV patient. It's Kaposi sarcoma until proven otherwise. The best initial and most accurate test is a biopsy of the lesion. On CCS, it'll basically tell you that, and you should go with the excisional biopsy. There is no treatment here. The goal is to get their CD4 count um, back up to good levels, you know, at least 200, ideally over 500. There are, by the way, uh, chemotherapeutics for disseminated disease, but you don't need to be aware of that. This is uh, what it looks like. So very, very distinct, even in the world of rashes. Toxoplasmosis is a parasitic protozoa that in HIV patients will generally affect the brain, and it presents like a brain abscess. So you should know how brain abscesses present, fever, headache, confusion, focal deficits. The diagnosis here is a CT with contrast, and you're looking for those ring-enhancing lesions. The most accurate test is a biopsy. So the reason that it's important to get that CT is because you want to know if you have ring-enhancing lesions, and you also want to have a baseline. And I'll, I'll tell you why that's important in a little bit. The treatment here is pyrimethamine and sulfadiazine, and then we add leucovorin onto that because pyrimethamine is a folate inhibitor. So we want to try to abate the side effects. If the patient has sulfa allergies, we replace sulfadiazine, obviously, with clindamycin. Why does clindamycin work for a parasitic infection? I do not know. Um, but these are the three drugs that we would use in a sulfa allergy. Now, if there is no improvement, um, in the patient's symptoms after a couple weeks, then we do a brain biopsy. Does anyone know why? That's why. We're worried about CNS lymphoma, which has nearly an identical presentation, um, and it would give you similar findings on the CT. Um, so this is why uh, we would get the brain biopsy. We prophylax for toxoplasmosis when they dip below 100. And what you'll give is either Bactrim or pyrimethamine dapzone in leucovorin if they are sulfa allergic. So as you can see in just general prophylaxis for people who don't have sulfa allergies is really nice because we don't even need to worry about prophylaxing for toxoplasmosis. If they're dropping below 100, we're going to be giving them prophylaxis for PCP and that is 
trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. However, if they have a sulfa allergy, um, then on a, in addition to dapsone, which we're already using for PCP prophylaxis, we're going to need to add pyrimethamine and leucovorin. This is what it looks like on CT. You can see these ring-enhancing lesions. Cryptococcal meningitis, we talked about in some of the ancillary diseases. Um, so basically here, it's a fever and a headache. It looks like meningitis, except they're lacking one of the salient features, which is meningismus. Uh, fewer than one in five will have that. So fever and headache in an HIV patient, you should think of cryptococcal meningitis. The best initial step, like most pe people with a fever and a headache, is going to be to get a lumbar puncture for CSF. Uh, the standard rules apply. If they have focal signs, get a CT first. The CSF will show monocytes. That's pretty unique to fungal meningitis. The most accurate test is a cryptococcal antigen test. The treatment here is amphotericin B and flucytosine for two weeks. Once they begin to have improvement, then you can switch to oral fluconazole, and that should be taken indefinitely. These patients who have ever had a cryptococcal infection should be on fluconazole for life. And then when do we prophylax for cryptococcal meningitis? When they dip below 50 and we use fluconazole. However, if these patients have not had an actual cryptococcal infection before, we can take them off of their fluconazole. However, if they've had an infection, it's fluconazole forever. Okay, so MAC is another pulmonary infection, but unlike PCP, it happens much later, and it also has some different symptoms um, that kind of make it stand out. So it is primarily a pulmonary infection, but it can disseminate. So you'll start out with kind of flu-like symptoms and a cough, and then this will eventually progress to involve the GI system and the liver. So you can get a diarrhea along with it, hepatomegaly, uh, and you can also even get anemia. So when you think of a cough and pulmonary symptoms and then diarrhea, what's the very first thing you think of? probably Legionnaire's disease. And this has a kind of similar presentation, uh, but you would see it in an HIV patient. And then you'd also see this anemia, which is would not be typical for Legionnaire's. Um, so you're going to suspect this based on routine labs. Look for anemia, elevated elk foss. The best initial test because these patients have a pulmonary presentation is going to be a chest x-ray. It's useful to get a blood culture. Pretty much anyone with HIV AIDS who uh, is sick looking, you should get a blood culture. Um, these together have very high sensitivity and specificity. The treatment here is threefold. It's azithromycin, ethambutol, and rifibutin. Um, so you can see that these two drugs here are commonly used for TB, which makes sense because this is a similar bacteria. I would give rifabutin and not rifampin when you're dealing with an HIV patient because rifampin has a tendency to interfere with antiretrovirals. Um, so azithromycin, ethambutol, and rifabutin, and this is going to be the same whether the patient is allergic to sulfa drugs or not because none of these are sulfa drugs. We prophylax for MAC when they drop below 50, so we give azithromycin. So as, oh, oh okay, now we have CMV. Okay, so one more. Uh, so CMV infections are common in AIDS patients. Um, it tends to be retinitis on your exam, but you can see encephalitis, esophagitis, and colitis, and you can look that up as you wish. So when it comes to retinitis, look for a change in vision in a patient with an HIV patient. Your next step is going to be fundoscopy. Uh, the treatment here is gancyclovir, uh, which is given IV, uh, and then once there is improvement, uh, you will then have them on valgancyclovir um, until their CD4 count goes beyond 100. When else do we give CMV prophylaxis? Anyone under 50, and that's a CD4 count under 50, not an age under 50. Okay, this is CMV retinitis. This is what it should look like. You should have this normal kind of circular uh, fundus there with vessels coming out. What you see here um, with CMV retinitis is sort of this pepperoni pizza-like appearance where you've got this sort of uh, yellowish area here and then little hemorrhages that kind of look like pepperonis. I don't know. That's what the pathologists say. So this is sort of an overview of 
how we prophylax. So it's fairly straightforward in uh, non-sulfa-allergic patients. It's going to be Bactrim when they drop below 200, add on azithromycin when they drop below 50, and then cryptococcal and CMV prophylaxis will also be below 50 or if there's a history of infection. For sulfa-allergic patients, we start with Dapzone, and then once they drop below 100, we'll add pyrimethamine and leucovorin, and then as usual, once they drop below 50, we add azithromycin, and then the same rules apply for cryptococcal and CMV. And this is just a recap of everything we talked about.